I'd like to welcome everybody here. We're grateful for our sponsors to make this possible. Um, you've been hearing them all day yesterday. There's um, MongoDB, Xmission, a bunch of them. Anyway, and now I'm going to turn the time over to Margaret. Hey everybody, I'm going to talk about the uh, Symphony PHP framework. Um, in the uh, promotional materials it says Symphony 2, but Symphony 3 actually just came out, so this talk has been updated, but I do make note when the things that I'm talking about are new in Symphony 3. Mostly everything is the same, so if you are using Symphony 2, most of the stuff is totally applicable, and if you just take note of the things that have changed for Symphony 3, you should be able to adapt it to an older Symphony 2 version, no problem. It's not a huge change like Symphony 1 to 2 was. Okay, uh, my name is Margaret Staples, and it is nice to meet you. I like elephants and daisies, so there is a sort of a theme of the slides. Um, I have been working with Symphony for about four years, um, and I am developing a social strategy city builder RPG game of awesomeness, which is currently in open beta, and you can play it over game.com if that interests you at all. And that is actually how I learned about the Symphony framework, because I developed it based on that. Um, this is what we are going to cover today, an overview, uh, installation and configuration, file structure, uh, my first page, route controller template, uh, creating an entity, interacting with an entity, installing a bundle, creating a command, creating a service, and I will take questions. However, if you have a question while I'm going on, you can just get hand up in the air, and I am generally more than happy to pause and take your questions as we go, because I know this is a lot of ground to cover, and I don't want you to forget your questions before we get to the end. Okay, so um, there are going to be a lot of assumptions in this talk because um, one of the things that makes Symphony kind of intimidating is that they try and offer you a million different ways to do everything. So what I'm going to cover is mostly just how I do things, which will give you a map with which to navigate the, the framework. And if you want to learn about different options of how to do things, you can investigate the documentation, which is quite thorough. So um, the first assumption we're going to make is that you have a web server and that it is Linux because I have a web server and it is Linux. Um, we are going to uh, install Composer because we are going to be using Composer both in our installation and management of our Symphony framework. If you don't already use Composer, I highly recommend that you go to um, getcomposer.org and read their very simple, very straightforward documentation. Once you get into using Composer, you will realize that your life has become infinitely better. Highly recommend it. It's awesome. So um, installing Composer is a basically a two command line commands. Uh, you uh, assuming you have curl installed, I'm assuming you have curl installed. Uh, so you uh, curl the installer, um, and then the second line is actually optional. That just makes the composer install global, so you just use the composer to trigger a composer command instead of using composer.bar. Um, I, I prefer that, so I just included that second line for you. It is optional, but L will be, yes? Um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if you symbolically link that instead of moving it, then you can upgrade and your link doesn't break. Perfectly reasonable point. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have a web server, we have in, a composer installed, and we're also going to assume that whatever you were doing with the Symphony framework, you're probably going to want to use a database at some point in that. So just go ahead and set up, set up a database, an empty one, and just note the name and the root password because you're going to need that during the Symphony install. Okay, now there are two, now that there are Symphony 3, there are now two key ways to install the Symphony framework because they've come up with a Symphony installer. So I'm going to cover both the new Symphony installer and I'm also going to then cover how to just set it up for Composer because these two things are slightly different. Mostly the same, slightly different. Okay, so to get the uh, Symphony installer, we're going to curl again. Um, we're going to just go grab the installer um, and then we're going to um, change mod it so that it is what it needs to be. Um, and then we are going to use the special new create, uh, create a new project man, which is just like simply new project name, and of course project name is going to be the name of your project, so it will probably be a little bit more descriptive than project name. I recommend your project name to be descriptive. Um, that's why it's highlighted in green, because you're just going to change that to whatever. Uh, and then we are going to open up what has just been created in the new directory structure that has just been created by that command that we just ran. Um, in app config parameters.yml, you're going to see a bunch of values and the three that you're going to want to look at and make sure they match what we've just set up are the database name, database user, and database password. 
Okay, now we're going to look at the other key way to install the Symphony Framework if you'd rather use Composer. There is, uh, there, is there are perks to this method. Um, but you will just use Composer, Create, Project, Symphony, Sim Framework Standard Edition, and then highlight it in green, whatever project name you want there. Um, and then because we are using the Composer installer, the way Symphony is set up is as part of the installation process, it's going to ask you a series of questions, and your answers are going to automatically generate that parameters.yml <coughs> that if you use the Symphony installer, you then have to go in and edit manually. If you use the Composer method, it just asks you a series of questions. You can take the defaults on most of them, but go ahead and make sure that your database name, user, and password are updated. And also go ahead and change the secret that's, uh, that's for use with uh, forms. So the default there is, this isn't very secret, is it? So just go ahead and change it to like, well, like the random hashers, just series of whatever, whatever, something random that you know and that isn't, this isn't very secret, is it? Okay, so um, now that you're set up, the thing you want to do is you want to check your configuration. This, <laughs> this didn't used to exist and used to be really frustrating because you just like, oh, I've got a Symphony installed, and you can like go to the default page and it's like, everything's broken and I have no idea why. But now, instead, you can go to localhost and whatever your project name is, um, and then web and then config.php, and it will tell you exactly what's wrong and where to go fix it. And you can see this, this is a very common problem when you do a new install, is you just need to set the permissions on your cache and logs directory so that they can be accessed. And that's not a big deal, you can fix that, and then suddenly, yeah, it's fine. But if there are other issues um, with your personal setup, it will go ahead and tell you here so you can address them, which is very handy. Okay, so um, now we're going to generate an empty bundle. Bundle is what um, Symphony calls your, your project, your code. Um, and it, it, it assumes that you're going to want one, one bundle per significant programming task or app that you're developing. Um, so in order to create a new one, we're going to use the on the command line, we're going to say php bin slash console generate bundle. The command name is generate bundle. All commands in <coughs> Symphony reference bin console. The reason bin is highlighted is because in Symphony 2, it used to be app console because this is this is a location and that is a location relative to the root of your project. So if in the command line you've navigated around and you're like 10, 10 folders deep in some subdirectory, this isn't going to work. You need to back up all the way to the root of your project and because you're referencing a specific location in Symphony 2, it was app console. In Symphony 3, it's now bin console. But very straightforward, you get very used to it because all commands in Symphony are prefaced with this. Um, and then the command generate bundle. Um, it'll ask you to specify a bundle name. You should name it whatever you want, bundle. There are some naming conventions in Symphony. We're going to talk about them. One of them is every bundle name ends with the word bundle, uh, camera case. Um, and then we're going to set the, de the default target directory. Uh, it, the default is source. Go ahead and use that as the default. That's what we're going to assume. Um, and then specifying YML for configuration, you don't have to. There are a lot of options. Um, in fact, I think the default has actually changed away from YML, but YML is what I prefer, so YML is what I'm going to cover in this presentation because there's no way that I could cover like all five different ways that you can do it, so we're going to go with YML. If you want to do something else, there are all sorts of docs available. Do what you feel. Okay, so now let's look at the directory structure that we've created with all these automatic commands. Where we have uh, app, bin, source, tests, var, finger, and web. And all the ones that are starred, those are new in three. They don't exist in two, so if you do a two install, those will not be there. If you do a three install, they will. Okay, so in app, the important things that you want to note are um, the app kernel, and this is where you include uh, all the bundles. These are both bundles that you create yourself and also any bun third party bundles that you install with other people, they need to be listed here to be included in the overarching project. And if you remove bundles, you need to remember to go ahead and remove them here as well or you will get an error. It will tell you that it can't find something that's listed there because it is void. Um, also, with app config parameters.yml, we've already looked at this. This is what was generated automatically when we did the composer install or what you have to go ahead and edit when you use the regular Symphony installer. Um, this is just the project parameters. Um, and app config config.yml, this is where you put any custom config options for your project or any other third party bundles that you install. Uh, security.yml, this is where you set up your firewall and any specific uh, 
security configuration that any bundles that you create or install need. And app config routing.yml is project wide routing. Um, actually, when we get into our bundle, we're going to see that there's bundle specific routing, but this is your overall project wide routing here at the top of your project. Um, Bin, this is one of the directories that's new in 3.0. Um, before this content was located under app, but now you got it in bin, and in like bin console is what we use to run all the commands. Um, in var, this is uh, this is also this was also located under app in pre 3.0. Now it is a new directory, and this is where you will find uh, where the project will store its cache files and also where it will store its logs. Um, vendor is where some people install other people's bundles. Um, web is for generated and or linked web assets. Um, tests, also new in 3.0, will hold uh, unit and functional tests project-wide. However, the important thing that we want to focus almost all of our attention on is the source directory because this is your everything. Um, this contains all of the code and assets for your bundle. For the most part, if it's not here, it's not your problem. If you're installing a third-party bundle, you're going to leave this directory. If you're writing project-wide tests, you're going to leave this directory, but like 99% of your time working in Symfony is going to be inside the source directory. That's your home. So inside, let's look inside the source directory. Um, you're going to find a directory that's the same name as the bundle that you just generated on the command line. So we're going to say that we named it my bundle because we're assuming we're not very creative and we have no particular vision. <coughs> Um, and in that, in the our my bundle directory, we're going to find some default uh, bundle uh, directories. The first one's controller. It's going to contain uh, all of the. In, well, it's going to take contain first a default controller, but it will eventually you might create more controllers, and they will all go here. Um, and controllers hold all of the logic for rendering a page. Um, then there's the resource directory, which has some subdirectories that are noteworthy. Uh, one of them is config, the, con the config directory under resources that contains routing.yml, which assigns routes to controllers within this bundle, uh, and services.yml, which contains definitions for any custom services that you want to create as part of your bundle. Um, also in resources, we have public, which is where JavaScript, uh, image, and CSS asset directories will be for your bundle, which you will then uh, link to the top level web either with some links or copy over. There's a command line thing for that. Some people like to just store all of these assets in that top level uh, web directory. I don't. I prefer to keep things as much in their individual project. Uh, directory as possible because it's nice to have things in one place associated with the different files that they are going to be used by. Um, and then also in the resources directory is a views directory which contains, which is where you will find a directory for every controller that you, well you need to create a directory for every controller, you'll find the default one there that was created as part of the uh, creating new bundle package. Um, and these, uh, this is where all your templates go. Your controller, they'll put together all the logic, and then they will send everything that they have gathered up that they want to display, all that data, they'll send it into a template for actual display, and in the views directory is where you'll find or create that template. Um, okay, so do we have any questions about the basic file structure and installation process before we move on? Okay, so now we're going to talk about creating our first super, super simple page, which is going to center around the relationship between the route, the controller, and the template, because that's all you need for your basic, straightforward, hello world first page. Okay, so we're going to open up resources config routing.yml, and we're going to see that uh, it created us a first default route, um, and it's named uh, my home page, and you can see that it's uh, the, the path forward is just slash, that means it's the default, your top level, and you just go to your domain, it's going to be right there. Um, and then defaults, that tells it what controller to send anything going to this route to. And you can see that we're sending it to, um, we're, we're using my bundle because that's what we named it. And then we're going to the default controller, which will be named default controller. <coughs> controllers directory. Um, and then inside that controller file, you will see index action, which is the particular function that this route will send to. Uh, so yeah. Line one is the route, line two is the route path, line three uh, specifies the controller and the function that we're sending any routes of this type to. Okay, so some things about options within a route. 
um, on that line two, uh, the path. If you need to have, um, if you need to accept values through a URL, you just put the name that you would like that variable to be, and you put it inside curly brackets, and the router knows that that means that it will accept variable information in that space, and it will assign it to that variable name, and it will send it to the controller function that you have named in the default line. Another thing to know about graphs is that on line three, that default line, you can also assign default values for those variables that you put in the URL, which means that that, means that makes them optional. If you have default values for them and then somebody puts in that URL without any, any information where those variables are being sought, then it doesn't, it's not going to throw an error. Instead, it's going to use that default value that you specified on line three don't specify a default value and somebody tends to access that route without anything in the place where you're looking for variables, it will sit in there. Okay, so looking at the controller directory, you will see that it has automatically generated for us a default controller, default controller.php. This is another symphony naming convention, which is that all controller files need to end with the word controller before the PHP extension. Um, and inside controller, you'll see that it's also created your first uh, controller function, which is index action. Um, and that is another symphony naming convention. All controller functions that are going to send to a template from a route in, in action. If you send a route to some function name, and then when you're defining that function in your controller, you don't end it with the word action, it will not know what you were talking about and it will send an error. So that's actually a very common thing to have because you maybe you don't think about it because it's not part of the routing structure. And so if you get an error, the first thing you check is, oh, did I remember to tack the word action onto the end of my function definition? Okay, so, um, Let's mod we're going to modify the index action because what, is, what the default does is it just sends it straight to a template and we want to actually take a look at transmitting information from the controller into the template. So we're just going to make um, a title variable and we're going to just assign a simple string to that. And we're also going to make a messages array and it's going to be an associative array and we're going to use colors as the keys and then we're going to just have little messages as the values and this is just for an example, this is not any grand plan, it's just because we're going to look at how that works in the template in a second. And then you can see that what we're doing is we're returning this render and then this long string. And if we break down the string, what we see is that we're telling it what bundle we're going to find the template in. So we're referencing our bundle. We could reference a different bundle, but we're referencing the one that we're, we created and are working with. And then we're going to tell it what directory to look for the, for the template, and then we're going to tell it the template name. And then following that, we're going to send an array, which is an associative array, and the keys here are going to be the variable names in the template, and then the values are going to be what those variables hold. So very straightforward. So then if we look at our, our, the default template that was created for us, we see that it's a very simple hello world, doesn't even contain any variables or anything. But we also see that in addition to HTML, we have an additional extension, which is .twig, because that means that we're going to be using the, the twig templating um, tags, which are super, super useful. I, I know that you can make, um, make templates using PHP, but honestly, the temptation when you're making a template in PHP is if you need some additional logic that you didn't think about in the controller, it's, it's really unfortunately tempting to just go ahead and put it in the template when you didn't really need to have that logic there, you really needed to have it separated out. Um, and with twig, it gives you all the tools that you need for the basic logic to actually put together something visual, but it doesn't overburden you with too many options that really you don't need when you're just creating a template. So some basic things to know about Twig is if you want to, um, oh yeah, let's, let's go. Um, if you want to display a variable, you just use the variable name and you uh, surround it with double curly brackets. And if you, want to, if you want Twig to execute some simple logic, instead of the double curly brackets, you have curly bracket percent and then the closing curl, uh, percent curly bracket. So this is just uh, an example of how we might modify that template to use the variables that we've just sent it from the controller. You can see that we are checking to see if the title, it has a length greater than zero, just in case something's gone terribly wrong and it doesn't. This is just a demonstration of a simple if statement and uh, one of the filters that you can use that's built into Twig. Uh, which is length. Um, and this works both on strings and it also works on arrays the same way. Um, and you can see that if we find that our title has a length at all, that we're going to go ahead and display the title tags. Um, and then we're going to loop through 
that array that we created and sent to the template. And we're just going to, since we used color names as our keys, this is just showing that you can have access to both the key name and the value in an associative array, and you can use both if you happen to want that for something. So what we're doing is we're using the, the key name as the color for each message in turn, and that might look something like this here. Very straightforward. Okay, so, wow, my just broke. Oh well. Um, you also might um, want to, okay, so when you're using, um, when you're using additional materials like images and JavaScript and CSS, um, you can you can store that either um, in your app resources directory, which um, if you name any subdirectories in the top level app resources directory after one of the um, one of the bundles, you can overwrite um, templates and such that are in those lower bundles. Um, that's just something that you should know. I'm not going to go deep into that because we have a lot of ground to cover. But just so you know, you can overwrite. Um, template, template and asset information that exist in both your bundles and in external bundles by using that top level app resources directory. Um, now, but I recommend using putting all of your stuff in your bundles resources directory. Um, and then in order to have those links to that top level web directory, which is uh, where I look for it, you just run a simple command, PHP, bin console, assets install, simply web. Um, there is a <coughs> set of asset management, which you may or may not want to use. If you do, keep in mind that you will also need to run the command PHP bin console aesthetic dump. Um, and if you are using, if you want to like to have that work in the production environment, you'll need to also do the flag environment equal fraud. Okay, so um, as your project expands, you might want to have more than just a default controller. I do highly recommend that if you are putting together a complex project, you start to have specialized controllers that just contain um, functions that have some sort of similar theme. Like for example, in the game, I ended up with controllers such as a session controller, a form controller, a uh, data character controller versus a data settlement controller. Just to have the, the, the different pages that have sort of a theme separated out into uh, descriptively named controller files because that makes it easier to manage a project as it expands. Um, and what I'm just showing underneath here is where, as your first uh, controller will extend controller, uh, future controllers, if you would like them to be able to access each other more easily without, then, then you can just extend them in a line. You don't have to. There are ways to get around that. I'm just showing that that is an option. And the image broke, but what you should see here is that I am now suggesting that if you have any questions about making a simple page before we move on, that would be the time. Yes. Is Twig a, an acronym or is that just the name that they picked? No, no. Okay. But it's cool and yeah. they have great documentation. If you're interested, you should totally check it out. And it's also an expanding project. And one of the really cool things about it is that if uh, the filters that they have aren't sufficient for your needs, you can make custom filters actually pretty easily. It's wow. cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. As I mentioned, we set up a, a database when we first installed this project because I'm assuming that if you are making a project that has like a giant framework and that you probably are going to be using the database at some point because why else are we even using PHP? Um, so we're going to create a new directory inside of our bundle directory and that's called entity and that's where we're going to put all of our entities which um, will describe database tables that we want. Um, we're going to create our first entity file and we're going to call it item.php. Um, we're going to use annotations to define our entity because I use annotations to define my entity. Other people like doing it in other ways and they are welcome to do that. There's plenty of documentation as to how to seek that out. Okay, so for an example, we might define a column as being a decimal and we're going to tell it uh, that it's going to have a scale of two and that means we're going to track up to two decimal uh, up to two points after the decimal place. Um, or we might have another column that's a string and we're going to say that it has a length of one because currently we only want to support one character in, in that column, but you could have Links. Um, and if you would like to know more information, you can check out docs.doctrineproject.org for lots more documentation on doctrine. So this is what a sample entity might look like. 
you can see that we are telling it through annotations that this is uh, an ORM entity and that the table name is item. Um, and then we just have a class that is named for our table. And then the first thing that I always put in all of my uh, <coughs> in all of my doctrine annotated entities is that I would like there to be an ID column and I would like that to be an auto-generated value. And here's just a slightly expanded example of different uh, column declarations yeah. that you might have. Uh, name, value, available, uh, string with a length of 64 because maybe you want more than one character sometimes. Yes? Um, does it come with Dr. Yes, required? that's not, it's okay. I'm talking about the Symphony standard edition yeah. framework. That's just a bunch of defaults that they suggest, which includes things like Twig and Doctrine. However, one of the cool things about Symphony is that you can just install the individual components that you want. You can basically roll your own custom framework out of their components. Nice. Yes, and it's all completely supported, but I'm covering the standard edition okay. just to give you an overview of some of their suggested components. Perfect. And Doctrine is one of their suggested components. Um, and uh, one, one thing to note is null will equal true. You do have to note that if you would like a column to be equal to hold a null value. Otherwise, if you attempt to save a record without a value or with a null value there, it will throw an error. So it's important that if you would like it to be able to be nullable, you throw that nullable tag in there. Okay, so once you have some entities defined, uh, you just run some command line commands in order to make that happen, like as far as your database goes. Uh, PHP bin console doctrine schema update force will actually examine all of your uh, annotated entities and it will create a database that make, matches what you have described with those annotations. PHP bin console doctrine generate entities um, bundle name entity specific entity name will generate getters and setters for that specific entity. If you leave off the specific entity name, it will attempt to generate getters and setters for everything in that directory. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. It's good to know there are options. Can you write getters or setters that you've If none exists, it will create a new one. If you've made a custom one with like 10,000 lines of like that, you will not lose it. It's fine. It's safe. You can run it 10,000 times. It will not clog up with useless stuff and it will not overwrite your custom stuff. That's a good question. Okay, so um, these are just how you might access, uh, the entity manager is how you access uh, these entities through Doctrine. Yes, you can absolutely write perfectly normal SQL queries instead and access the database directly, but if you would like to use Doctrine's entity manager, this is how you access it at various points within your project. Uh, if you're in a controller function, you're gonna use um, the get doctrine method followed by the get manager method. If you are in a if you are in a command, you're going to use the get container method followed by get doctrine. This is this the the get followed by the name uh, in single quotes. That's just how Symfony references uh, define services. So you're just getting the doctrine service, and then you can use I that should be an arrow, not just a dash. Um, then you get the the get manager uh, method, and you tell it that you want the default manager. Um, and if you are in a custom repository, you use just this get entity manager. This is just an example of how you might use the entity manager in a controller. Um, on that, about the third line of typing, you see items equals em, and em is of course what we have assigned to our entity manager. Um, we're going to get repository. We're going to say that the repository we're getting comes out of my bundle, which is the bundle that we've created. We're going to get the uh, item. It's going to be out of the item table, and we're going to tell it to find all. The find all is one of uh, the entity manager's handy little uh, uh, catch all methods. It's got uh, find all, it's find one by ID, find by, and then you can give it an array of values. And, and those are just shorthand methods. Uh, they're very good for putting together a project really quickly if you just want to like proof of concept. What follows is a uh, query builder, which is actually how you get a lot more specific. Um, and I definitely recommend that as your project progresses and you're past the draft stage, you replace those generic high volume requests that you can do really easily with something more specific when you really know where you're going so that you lower, lower your overall load. And you can see that we're just, we're gonna select something, we're gonna tell it where we're selecting it from, um, we're gonna use a, a simple like, we're going to set our max results, we're going to set an order by. There are all sorts of basic, like you would assume any sort of query would have. You can do get distinct, you can set the limit, um, you can do the order. All, all sorts of those basic things are built in. Here you can see 
see I'm getting a single result. You can also get all results, in which case you will, you will either return um, an array of objects where you would use your getters and setters off of those objects when you loop through them, or if instead of just select C, we had select C dot some specific column name, then we would get back an associative array that just contained the specific uh, column names that we were requesting. In a template, um, if you have um, a, an entity that you've passed directly to a template, it works just like an array. Um, so you just put um, you just put dot and then the name of the field that you would like to display. Um, if you have an associative array, you put dot and then the the key that you want to access. It so it treats it basically treats entities as if they were arrays. So they're the same. There's one caveat to that. If you have named a column um, something with snake case like with underscore in the name, it doesn't really know how to handle that. So instead, you need to use the getter the getter name. So like if I had like this awesome thing with a bunch of underscores in it. Instead, you would do get this awesome thing in order to retrieve that value. But that's but for the most part, unless you're doing fancy long snake case column names, you can just you can just treat an entity in a, in a template just like you would treat an array. Okay, uh, another cool thing that you can do with Symphony is you can create custom commands, which is handy. Um, so if we want to create a custom command, we're going to go into our bundle directory and we're going to create a new directory called command. We're going to create a new file in that directory. Uh, we're just going to say that we're going to make the regenerate health command. This is another symphony naming convention. Commands in with the uh, camel case word command.php. Um, at the top, you can see some basic things that we might want to include. Uh, we want to make it a container word command. We want to allow for input. We want to allow for output. So we're going ahead and uh, using those symphony components. Um, then we just create the class with the same name as the command. Uh, we set up the configure, which tells it what we're going to name the command, i.e. what we will type on the command line in order to trigger this. Um, and then we can put in a description, and then execute is what will automatically run when you execute that command on the command line. Um, and at, right now it's just saying, uh, it's just going to output the word complete on the command line, because this is the most simple command you could possibly make ever. So let's make it a little more detailed. One thing we can do in the configure is we can say that we are going to want to take in additional information from the command line. So we're going to say that we're going to have a new input argument. We're going to say that we need a character ID. So we put in um, a description down here uh, on the, we're going to say it's required. And then we're going to say that the name of it in our execute is going to be car ID. So that's just our little tag that we're going to use to execute. But if the, uh, if the user on the command line say it's not in Site somebody else or somebody else with the command, so you don't know what's going on, and you just try to run regenerate health, but it's got this uh, required additional information in there, and you don't put it in there. What it'll do is it'll dump out that description of what it what it needs, so that you can say, oh oh oh, we need to put in the command. I just need to put it in with this additional information in that one. So it's important to go ahead and put in the descriptive description. So in order to retrieve that in our execute uh, function, where you see we've got the we've got the input interface input, so we're going to use that interface, uh, input interface input to retrieve car ID. See, so we've got input, get argument, car ID, and so it's automatically going to have stored that car ID um, and, and retrieve it for us, and we can assign it to a variable and we can use it um, in our function. Okay, so another really cool thing that you can do so that you don't clog up your controllers with a bunch of logic that doesn't be there is you can create a bunch of services and put your logic there and then reference it from any, any uh, uh, command or controller that you would like, which is super neat. So we're going to create a new directory in our bundle. We're going to call it services. Uh, then we are going to create a new PHP file within that directory. We're going to call it character effect.php because as you can tell, I've been developing games for a really long time without stopping. Uh, and then we're going to define the new service in our resources config services.yml. We touched on this very briefly before. So we have to define it one place and then we actually put it somewhere else. So we're defining it in config services.yml. Um, and so at the top, we're going to tell it where our service location is, which is in our bundle in that new services directory that we just created. Um, and then we've got um, all of these, then we can list all the services that are there that we're defining. This is our, going to be our character effect service. We're going to tell it where that is. We're going to tell it where the class is. And you can see that we've just created a parameter that is my service location, which just re references that definition there at the top. 
um, and then we're going to tell it that the specific class that we're looking for for the character effect service is the character effect class because you know when naming things matches it's easier. Um, and then we're going to tell it any arguments that we want to pass in. Here we're defining that we're passing in the entity manager, and that's an important thing to note. If you do not pass in the entity manager to a service, it does not have it. Services only have whatever you pass into them. You can pass into them just about anything you want, but if it doesn't have it, it doesn't have it. So go ahead, if you're going to need to access your database from inside the service, go ahead and pass in the entity manager um, with uh, at doctrine dot orm dot entity manager, which is just like you've define your service location, that's just where Doctrine defined its service location. It's just a shortcut. So now let's open up uh, in our service directory in our new PHP file that we just created. I do want you to note that uh, character effect is not character effect service .php. This is, this is, you know, not all naming conventions are universal. So here we've got uh, character effect .php not service. This is where we derail from our other naming conventions. Uh, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and see our, inside of our character effect class, the first thing we do is we uh, define the construct uh, function so that we can tell this class how it can access all of those cool things that we just passed in in this particular service all we passed in is the entity manager. So we're going to define the entity manager as being this EM and then you can see in our very, very simple empty um, service function, we are just going to reference that entity manager and assign it to the EM variable. Okay, so this is just uh, an example of maybe what an expanded uh, service function might look like. Uh, this is a word item and it's going to take in um, a, a character object, it's going to take in an item object, um, and then it's going to reference that entity manager that we passed into the service, and then it's going to do, and then it's going to go ahead and give that character that item, and then it's going to return a message that that has successfully happened. So this is just a couple of examples of how you might access our handy dandy service that we just created from inside of the controller. Um, it's very simple, you just use the this get. Remember we, we looked at that before, that's just uh, how we reference already defined services, and we just name it just like we defined it inside our services.yml, um, and then we reference the specific uh, service method that we are wanting to use, the word item, and then we pass in a character object and an item object because that's how we define that method. Um, from a command, it's only very slightly different. First, you get the container, and then you can get the service and the specific method that you want. You just need to remember that it's very, very slightly different depending on whether you're trying to access the service from a controller or from a command. Okay, uh, the other really cool thing that you're definitely going to want to do if you're using a Symfony uh, framework for your app is you're going to want to use other people's code, because why rewrite something that already exists? Um, so in order to install a third-party bundle, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to use the handy dandy composer require function and you're just going to tell it what the name of the bundle that you were trying to require is um, and then you're going to remember that every bundle in your project needs to be listed in that app kernel.php um, inside of your uh, app directory at the top level um, and you'll see there if you open it up since you've done a symphony install it will have automatically created a list of all of the bundles that it indicates you might want um, and so you just mimic that right, th right in that array, you just add a line for whatever you're installing. Um, don't forget the new <coughs> you'll see the list, just mimic it, you'll be fine. Um, and then go ahead and check that bundle's readme for any custom config that you might need to add. Maybe you'll need to add something in config.yml, maybe you'll need to add something in security.yml. That's what the readme is there for. Anything that's specific to that bundle, you'll find there. I know. Absolutely, very well supported, very well documented bundles specifically for facilitating uh, critic creation of rest APIs. Absolutely. Yeah. It's actually a very rich, uh, very rich uh, open source community. Um, there's uh, one particular group called Friends of Symphony. They make a lot of really cool bundles that they really think very good at documentation, very good at maintenance, very good at support. Um, and they're not the only ones, but they have just like a gigantic library of different bundles that are uh, good for different things. 
Um, there are lots of really cool buttons out there. In addition to like REST, there's stuff like uh, if you want different logins, say you want like a Google login or you want a Twitter login or all this other stuff. There are bubbles out there that already do that sort of thing. Like, a lot of two bubbles and stuff that you can just, you can read your docs, they'll guide you through it, you can plug it in, and so you're not writing everything yet, all the time. And, and it also gives you a nice support group, like, say it, suddenly you're getting behavior that you don't understand why you're getting it, it gives you somebody else that's already, like, or playing with, like, 20 people that have already messed with that, that you can, like, go bounce some ideas off of and, and, uh, and not just get be banging your head against the wall for a week. So it's nice. Makes projects more collaborative. Yeah. For a typical website project, maybe a content management system or an e-commerce or shopping site, would people generally make one bundle or would they create a bunch of bundles? I think it's up, I think it's up to your preference. I, I like, um, at least when I was first getting into Symphony 2, which was like four years ago, um, they were definitely encouraging you to split up your project into uh, into smaller bundles, but in the same directory. But as time has gone on, they've actually they've stopped encouraging that so much. Um, so I, I think I think it's very much dependent on the project and what they're into. Um, as far as CMS goes, I do want to mention that uh, Symphony actually has been pursuing their own CMS. So if that was something that you were looking into, they they actually definitely have a starting place for that. Thank you. So um, I hear that Drupal has kind of an API first um, approach where it, it can output pages in HTML as part of just a RESTful response, but it can also do um, JSON and other formats. Does Laravel do have a I'm similar Laravel, output? But I'm Symphony does, yeah. Symphony, sorry. Yeah, totally. Okay. Cool. Yeah, uh, no, it's very, it's not very flexible. I haven't played with that a great deal. Um, what I can tell you is, like, I've, I've done, I've done very much more specific stuff. Like, if I want a route to return JSON, that's all it does. But you can be a lot more flexible about that. I will tell you, they've got some really handy stuff. Like, you can return a new JSON response, and it went. You can just plug in an array, and it automatically formats it for you. You don't even have to think about it. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, if you think of anything later, you can feel free to track me down. Um, the, uh, this is the slide link. Um, if you if you decide later that you would like these slides and you have forgotten this link, it is also on. It is also linked from the join in. Please go to the join in for this talk and every talk that you see while you are here and rate it. Um, that is the only way that speakers get better. Maybe I missed something that you wanted to hear about. Maybe I covered something too quickly or too slowly or in an incorrect way, or you'd like more options presented, or you think I smell funny. I don't really care. Tell me what your favorite cupcake is. Just go to the joined in page and give some feedback, some rating, and not just for me, for every talk that you attend, because it really is very important to people that put forth the effort to put together these talks and get up here and conquer our overwhelming anxiety issues to talk for like an hour straight. Um, I am dead underscore Lugosi on Twitter. My DMs are open. If you have questions later that you just realized, you can always contact me there. Um, I also am generally lurking on Freenode as dead Lugosi without an underscore. Um, that's not happening right here during this trip because my laptop is trying to disintegrate, so I'm borrowing other people's and I'm like, what's even a Mac? I don't know. Um, but generally, you can find me on dead Lugosi if you want to chat about Symphony or Docker or Twitter or just you know, cupcakes, whatever. Um, and BrewingGame.com is the game that I have been developing for the last four years. The social strategy, city builder, RPG, set the mythic renaissance. If you were into big mud style weird games, I am too, and you should totally make a test my game. Um, and that's it.